final speaker, um, Morag. Um, I see another PowerPoint, probably. OK, so Morag, the floor is yours. Thank you. Inviting us to take part today, it's very much appreciated. Um, you know, this is a very important subject, very close to our hearts, and um, we're very glad to be here to share our experiences as Cully SCP. Um, my presentation today, we're going to be looking, we're going to be talking about capacity building along value chains, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, though Cully SCP does work throughout ACP countries, and we want to share our experience and the model that we've developed over the last 15 or more years. So our mission as Colli SCP is to develop the agri-food trade in an inclusive and sustainable way. We have a particular focus on, on fruit and vegetables from ACP countries, and we're looking at supporting food safety in export markets, but also regional and domestic markets. We are an association, we're a private sector association, and our uh, core activities are, as you'd expect for an association, market intelligence, technical assistance, training, etc. And we deliver our support through programs. Uh, Mr. Mitzi earlier on mentioned um, some of the programs that have been supported through the European Union, in particular the PIP and the EDIS programs. PIP worked for many years in supporting private sector operators primarily, and EDIS uh, addressed the establishment of national food safety systems, uh, primarily supporting the public sector. Uh, our current program, Fit for Market, is building on the previous work that we've been doing over the past 15 years. Um, it's part funded also by uh, AFD, and we are also engaging and participating in other programs supported by a diversity of different players. Food safety has been really at the core of the work that we've been doing over this time. You know, essentially we've been trying to facilitate market access, local, regional and international, but without food safety, basically as we've heard from the speakers this morning, you have nothing, you have no starting point. So we focus very much on food safety as a fundamental element of the work that needs to be done, um, and we've operated on, on, a, on the basis of a number of really key principles. The first of these is that achieving food safety um, and developing food safety capacity um, is a challenge, uh, but food safety is food safety wherever you are. You have a certain number of basic principles, um, some really important methodologies and procedures that need to be, um, need to be shared. But sharing these and localising them and getting them to be adopted and integrated is a very challenging process, especially when you're working in very diverse environments. And so one of our first um, approaches, our, our really important elements of trying to achieve this, is by working primarily always through local service providers, through local players. 90, 70 percent of all the work that we do in um, ACP countries is actually delivered by local players, public and private sector. Um, we have an approach to deliver this by starting with um, the training and, and the capacity building of a group of master trainers that operate on a global and regional basis. Those master trainers then deliver their capacity building to your local experts your national experts um, in extension services, in universities, in training centres, um, and many local um, private sector service providers. These in turn, once they're trained uh, through our support, we then hire them to deliver training at the sharp end to in-company trainers, through uh, to extensionists, to NGO agronomists, etc., who in turn then pass that message on to um, workers, the on the ground uh, food business operators, from smallholders to workers to transporters, etc. So it's basically trying to reach all players along the supply chain through this cascade approach. The training focuses not only on the te technical messages, but also on the pedagogical messages. You know, how you deliver that, how you actually uh, get those messages across and get them ingrained and get them adopted. 
Uh, we have a variety of training materials that have been adapted to these different um, different targets. And to give you some idea of, of, of the, the sort of quantities involved, we have about 80 master trainers. We have about 800 in the next tier down of uh, national trainers. We have about 25,000 trainers now within companies and extension services. And over the past uh, years since the launch of PIP1, they've trained, we estimate, in the order of 5 million workers and um, small-scale growers. So following on from our guiding principles, firstly, it's how to localise and make sure that the message is relevant to the local context and is understandable and appropriate, context appropriate. But also, it's not just about um, sharing the knowledge. It's also in, in providing the skills. It's not the, just the what, but it's the how to implement. And so accompanying our training, we always coach um, the organisations, the companies, etc., that we support, so that they are able to adopt and internalise these messages and implement them. So it's not just about training on what a food safety management system is, but it's how you actually operate that on a sustainable and ongoing basis. And very importantly, to ensure impact, it's the what, the why, but the what, the how, but also the why. Um, culturally, often. Uh, the messages are, um, are new, they're, they're not necessarily easily expressed or easily adopted, but to understand the implications of not doing, uh, not following procedures, not adopting good practice is essential and it's really important to ensure and ingrain a change in behaviour over the long term. So what we try to do is make sure that the support we provide is sustainable by providing the skills to keep that training ongoing in a country by um, internalising it and by establishing a national capacity. We want to make sure that it's affordable over the long term, so um, you have a national capacity that is affordable for local players and e easily accessed. It needs to be responsive so that the training can and the messages can react quickly to changing demands, to changing needs, but also reactive to the local context. It needs to be relevant. Um, it needs to be relevant not only to the local context, but also to be um, appropriate for markets and to be really market-driven. And it needs to be scalable and it needs to be replicable. So what we've developed in the fruit and veg side, which is where we primarily work, can also be and has been, in fact, applied to other um, value chains, tea, coffee, uh, livestock, etc. So we try to achieve impact by developing capacities and resources all along the value chain. And this is really the essential message that we want to get over with our presentation today. Quali ACP, through the type of support uh, that we've been very fortunate to um, be able to work with from the European Union over the years, has allowed us not to just focus on one particular element, to, but to be able to focus on the many elements that, take, that um, operate within a value chain. Our main um, efforts focus on producers and companies that export and that process, but providing support to them alone will not achieve real impact over the long term. You also need to strengthen, and it's essential to strengthen, all of the operators in the enabling environment. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we've had um, a support programme that focused particularly on the public sector, but ensuring that public sector checks and balances and controls are in place is essential, not only to support you know, high-end export and local markets, but also to ensure that policy drives towards internalising these and towards addressing the needs of, of local and regional markets. Um, in addition to public sector competent authorities, we, we also work, as I've mentioned before, on training local service providers, be they public and private. We work with industry associations to make sure that the messages are transferred. We work with public-private platforms, which I'll come back to in a minute, but are very often essential to actually coordinating efforts to address food safety systems. Um, laboratories, analytical facilities, training centres and universities. Um, the numbers in there give you an idea 
of the number of players that we've been working with in each of these areas since um, the launch of PIP1 in uh, 2001. Um, I thought it would be quite useful to give an example of one particular country to really express um, and explain more clearly how, how we've tried to uh, roll out this approach, this value chain holistic approach, in order that we achieve real impact. Since 2016, under the new Fit for Market programme, we've, been, uh, we've already signed a memora memorandum of agreement and we're already working with 31 fresh produce companies that are processing, supplying and exporting fruit and vegetables from Kenya. And we have another 14 companies that have applied for support and are in the pipeline. Those companies source from around 100,000 smallholder outgrowers and they employ around 75,000 people. Um, most of those female, 56% of them are women. We're working through, th um, we're providing support to uh, three local consultancy companies with several more uh, requesting support and in the pipeline, but we are using these local service providers already to deliver support to those 31 companies. We're working with two federations and associations, universities, NGOs, and three public sector bodies. Um, at the moment, under Fit for Marking, Market, we're focusing very much on inspection services, um, on uh, control, national control systems, and on, on research organisations. Now, Kenya is a country that over the years has been very successful in developing a large uh, dynamic export sector. Uh, it's pr producing very high-end produce and it's for some years now been accessing European and other global markets. They've put in place, or they put in place, and they invested heavily in all the systems, including food safety, that were needed to get this to run and to operate. But a about two 2013, 2014, things started to go wrong. Import controls in EU country started to pick up pesticide residues. And all of a sudden, uh, there was a, a sort of chain effect, and it started to have really bad impact on the sector. Uh, there were increased import controls in Europe. There were reduced exports. Uh, companies were losing a lot of money. All of a sudden, in the ca at the county level, you started to see school attendance falling, where there was no longer any money within the system to pay for school fees through the outgrower, suppliers, etc. So there was a massive impact of these uh, pesticide residue exceedances. Why did they happen? Well, they happened for two principal reasons that were actually external to Kenya. Um, first of all, uh, very importantly, the people that they were selling to, predominantly EU retail, their practices were tending to encourage uh, bad practice along the supply chain. You had trading practices whereby last minute changes to orders we're encouraging people to side buy from um, suppliers that were outside their network of um, trained and controlled uh, suppliers. So they were buying basically through brokers and from suppliers that were not certified or were not controlled in any way. They were doing that because if they didn't, it was a perfectly rational business decision because otherwise they would face quite substantial fines. Uh, so there was a... a a driver there, an economic driver, that, that really um, forced them to start adopting bad and risky practices. Alongside that, the European Union, um, through their programme um, of pesticide MRL um, regulatory changes, the um, pax maximum residue level of one of the main products that was being used in Kenya was reduced to analytical zero. Um, I'm sure many of us know the process by wi under which this is happening. Uh, but essentially, very quickly, uh, they lost a product that was quite essential to their basic production practices. So these were two external factors that really had a, a major influence on their capacity to trade. But behind that, there were no the checks and balances that were needed in their national systems were not there. You didn't have uh, an easy access to alternative products, uh, pest management products, because there was a lack of research. There was a lack of research because national 
uh, programs have a tendency to invest staple crops and donors have largely pulled out of agricultural research in recent years, leading to an inherent weakness and inability to come up with alternatives quickly. There are issues with the pesticide regulatory system that was slow and also precluded a rapid adaptation to using other pest management technologies. You didn't have the information or the systems in place with the um, extension services to get the necessary information out to people so that they could change their practices quickly enough. National controls, national pesticide uh, monitoring systems were also problematic. Uh, export controls were also too weak. And so the result was that the national capacity to address this externally imposed problem was not there. And it gives you a very clear example of why you need a national capacity, a strong national capacity in place to address food safety problems that arise, whether those are in export markets or whether they are in local markets. And so this holistic approach, it's not, um, it's not a something that's an, an, a desire, it's an expectation and it's, a, it's actually a necessity. So in summary, um, we've heard today food safety is fundamental to trade, uh, it's essential to local, regional and international trade, but we've also heard much more important than that, it is absolutely fundamental because failing to uh, ensure safe food costs lives and it costs untold harm in countries around the world. We have a, an example here. Mr. Scannell mentioned previously some of the difficulties that we've had in Europe. Another, uh, about seven years ago, we experienced a very big food safety incident that resulted from the supply of contaminated seeds from Egypt to a farm in Germany, of fenugreek sprouts that resulted in the death of 50 people, uh, 4,000 4, people uh, very ill and hospitalised, and one and a half billion lost to the EU uh, economy. This is very well documented because we have the procedures and the, the capacity in place to adopt that. But throughout the world, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, this remains a critically important problem. It is a major source of mortality and malnutrition in the under fives and throughout population. So it's something that no one can afford to ignore. Um, it's very important that the more complex the supply chain, the greater the risks. And Isolina asked me to mention success stories. I think the fact that ACP countries continue to supply safe food to European markets from very, very complex supply chains is a, is a big success story. Um, they supply a variety of products, including fresh produce, which is immensely challenging. Uh, they've done that thanks to the huge developments made in their national sectors and to the support that they've received from a variety of donors. But the work is not done. We've heard this morning there are new challenges. In terms of the export sector, challenges in fresh produce are massive and continue to be so because of plant health, because of the regulatory environment, essentially, which continues to evolve and change. A big emphasis that is put on... Um, by, uh, chemical contaminants as opposed to biological for a variety of reasons. But most importantly, it's getting the progress that's been made um, from in the high-end export sectors and actually achieving real impact for consumers, ACP consumers in local markets remains a massive challenge. A food safety system, it'll fail by its weakest point. The fenugreek issue, it was one farm in Egypt and one farm in Germany that caused that massive upheaval and hardship and damage. And so it's critically important to, to have this approach whereby ensure that every chain, every link in the chain is secured and risks are managed to make sure that food is safe. This holistic approach is therefore essential. Uh, and it's essential that we work collectively in order to achieve that. Cod ACP has been very fortunate to benefit from programmes that have allowed us to adopt this um, holistic approach, but many other programmes uh, work on particular elements in a supply chain that are not necessarily joined up. Uh, we as, as partners in this venture, as donor partners, as practitioners, 
it's critically important that we don't compete. We need to be coordinating. And I really endorse the, the findings of the GFSP report that, that really addresses the, those, some of those issues. Uh, so we need to be looking at how best we do that at a global level, at a regional level, and at a national level. And the mechanisms are there in order to do that, but we really need to be using them. So I think that's really our main message of, of the day. It's a holistic approach achieved through coordination and partnerships. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Morag, on that coordination dimension. I hope that we can discuss this during the, the, uh, the Q&A.